All right, everybody, welcome back. Excited to get into the latest and greatest in the financial independence community. And actually, I guess to kind of tee this up, Brad, I threw a bumper at the beginning of the episode that we did with Joanna Penn before we rolled it out. Just, just acknowledging a few ridiculously titled articles that I had seen saying, is the financial independence movement over? Is it all gone? <laughs> and, I, and you didn't get a chance to respond or weigh in on that, but man, are they right? Is it over? <laughs> Oh man, that is uh, really genuinely the most preposterous thing I've heard in a long time. I think uh, the financial independence movement was born out of the 2008 recession. And I think in times of turmoil, people need this information now more than ever, right? Like it's easy to delude yourself into believing that living paycheck to paycheck or even getting into a little credit card debt is okay in times of plenty, right? Like so many people delude themselves into thinking that like, oh, I can pay my bills. I'm going along to get along, right? Everything's happy. But man, you know, to, uh, for Game of Thrones fans, winter, winter is coming, right? Like, and, and that doesn't mean be doom and gloom. It means the good times are not always going to be there and you're fooling yourself if you think that, right? So like you have to plan for situations where things might get even minorly difficult, right? You might lose your job in, in, even in normal times, right? Like you might lose your job and you need to find a new job and it takes you 60 days, right? Like when you are following the path to FI, you have that runway. That's simple, right? Like that's just life and you have power. You don't need to say yes to the first job that comes along, right? Like, and now, Clearly now of all times, I haven't heard much doom and gloom financially from our community at all. And it's because they're in positions of strength, right? People who have been following the path to five for any period of time, any period of time whatsoever have been saving money. They've been thinking about their finances. They have a savings rate. They have emergency savings. Maybe they have even more than just there are three to six months of emergency savings. Hopefully many, many people have hundreds of of thousands of dollars. There are things to worry about right now, but so many people in our community are not at an existential crisis financially because they've been following the path to find. And I think tens of millions of people, if not more, just in the U S alone are going to wake up to the enormous life-changing power of the financial independence movement because they realize that it's not okay now to just kind of get along or just scrape by and, you know, just be blissfully unaware. I mean, that, that's the sad reality right now is people are realizing that's just not good enough. You cannot just plan for the best. You have to have that space between your income and your expenses. You need to save money, not for some retirement 50 years down the road for life. Life is bumpy sometimes. Obviously, this bump is bigger than any of us. This could be described as a pothole. Yes, (laughs) a very large mountainous pothole. But life is bumpy even in the best of times. So to only plan for the perfect scenario is foolish at best. So anyway, Jonathan, the, the short answer to your question is the fire movement is not only not going anywhere, I think the enormous life-changing power of this is going to be brought front and center to tens of millions of people. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's ridiculous, borderline irresponsible to have an article like that to chide people for saving money when the market is going down. Uh, it's, it's not going to age well, right? I mean, there's no universe where someone that has saved money and prepared when times were good is going to look back with regret on that preparation. And anybody that writes that article or fosters that line of thinking, well, just, it's not going to age well. So if someone, if, if someone comes to you and asks you like, what's your perspective on this? Just be honest. Like you're, it's not that you're not worried. It's just that you're not worried about your finances, right? You're, you're in a much better place now than you would have been in a vacuum where you were paycheck to paycheck. I think that's something that as a community, the financial independence community, I think that's something that we can all agree on. We are in much better shape now than we would have been in an alternate paycheck to paycheck scenario. Happy to talk about it more. If you have more questions, reach out to us. But I mean, that's just, it's just that simple. 
It, it really is. And here's where I want to say, you know, right now, and this is what I was getting at with that bumper at the beginning of that episode, because people are scared, because they realize that the status quo is terrifying, they're looking to build some financial resilience in their life. And maybe a, a money topic that historically has been taboo, they're actually willing to have a conversation now. What an opportunity to go with open arms and give information, give help, point to great resources, just be lend a hand of support when possible. Be there for our friends, our family members, our community. We're going to get through this together and it's not going to be without pain, but we are going to get through this. So anyways, actually with that, Brad, you know, I used that bumper at the beginning of the episode as a setup for Joanna Penn because 2008, this is actually something that we're referencing from Dom, who we're going to be having on the show here in the near future. Uh, but he describes something as an awakening. Now you can have awakening, usually an awakening happens for the vast majority of people because a traumatic event happens. And it forces you out of status quo. It forces you to analyze and make dramatic change. And 2008, if you were to look back, was a very traumatic experience for many people, Joanna Penn including. Look what she built from that. Look at the life she was able to carve because she said, you know what? I'm not going to settle for a six out of 10 anymore. I want to reclaim decades of my life and I want to spend my most precious non-renewable resource, my time. I want to spin that in pursuit of something that actually gets me excited. And I want to have, I want to have a life that I can run towards, not something that I'm running away from. That is the inflection point that many of us will experience over the coming months. What an opportunity to look at the problem a little bit differently. And Brad, I know you were inspired when, when we finished recording it, like your exact words to me were, we need to release this episode immediately. <laughs> yeah, that about covers it. I when we recorded this and certainly listening to it again, I mean, this is a top ten episode of Choose a Five for me, and that you know, I don't say that lightly. I I just had like energy coursing through my veins, and w when listening to her story and you know, looking at a problem a little bit differently, right? Like, I think that is how you describe how she's looked at her entire business life. And let's make no mistake here. She looks at this as a multifaceted business, right? So many people have limiting beliefs. How many people do you know that are quote unquote creatives that have these limiting beliefs that, oh, it's selling out to to try to look at this as a business or, oh, I, I could never be a sellout. I, I'm in it for my art. Well, Joanna would argue they're not mutually exclusive, right? Like if anything, looking and focusing on the business side has augmented her audience, right? Dramatically so because she's been able to find these successful ways to raise her profile through podcasts and things like this, like that ultimately have nothing to do with the actual books that she's writing, but yet that clearly makes her an expert in a field and people look to her. That is helping her dramatically. She has many different sources and lines of income from this one overall business. So I, I think that is just, it really inspired me because I think a lot of people do get held back by those limiting beliefs or they're, they're satisfied with maybe one successful line of business. And you know, it's working. And again, it's working in good times, but who knows what happens, but when you diversify yourself, you have options, right? And you can always drill down on things that are working or that you want to see succeed more, or maybe just where your passion and your energy is, right? Like having that option, just optionality in life is a positive. And, and I think Joanna typified that like no one else I've seen. So MK, I know this was a huge episode for you. I know that she is a personal hero of yours and you advocated for her to come on the show. Uh, you know, you, you, you joined us on the, on the episode as well. Just like what has her personal journey meant for you as a source of inspiration and you know, what actions have you taken in her own life because of kind of the path that she illustrated for us? 
Yeah. So I think she really underscored some important points that I've taken to heart. And that is, you know, we look at her success now and we say, wow, that's amazing that she built this. But then reminded she started in 2000, she said 2007, but she really, the fire was lit in 2008 when, you know, the global economy collapsed. And she said, you know, she had a couple years of maybe making a thousand dollars. Like, you know, it took a while to build the momentum and then over time it got there. And I think that's a really good reminder to myself and also to other people in our community that if you're looking to build something now, you know, maybe you're panicked now about the economy. Maybe you're panicked now about when, where's that next paycheck going to come from? If you're, if you're worried about being furloughed or laid off, you know, start to build something now. It may not replace your total income. It, you know, it may take a while to do that and build to that, but it's that consistent effort. It's building those systems. And then over time, seeing that success. Um, and also knowing that, you know, from her saying she does fiction and nonfiction, I thought for so long I couldn't do both. And then, you know, you guys asked me, Hey, can you help with our book? And I said, Oh, sure. You know, <laughs> We learn all the things. Um, so I've actually taken from her more empowerment to say, no, I can define for myself the career that I want to make for myself as an author. And that is I write sci-fi and thriller. And yes, I also now have my own nonfiction books about self-publishing and things like that because I want to help more people and be there for people. So um, I've definitely taken a lot of inspiration from her. Um, but I know I, I'm not even going to try to compare. You know, I'm going to make my own path. I'll be inspired by her, but I'm not going to not going to try to follow anybody else's path because that's not going to it's not going to end well. I'm going to be a lot of comparison. It's not going to be good for uh, my psyche, but uh, it's very inspiring to see that somebody who is so successful and wants to give back so much um, after all of that success. So that was a really positive outcome from that. And MK, I saw you kind of nodding along here on the video when I was talking both about her her different lines of business, but also about about maybe limiting beliefs that that people who consider themselves creatives that that they hold. And I'd love to hear you talk about both of those things. Yeah. So first with the different lines of business, I mean, she makes it really clear for herself, like each book is its own profit line for her. So each series, each book, and that's something I've started to evaluate of saying, this isn't just a work of art. This is how is this going to move the needle so I can continue to do this down the line um, and building multiple lines of business for myself. And I think that's something to keep in mind. So maybe your passion isn't writing. Maybe your passion is photography. Well, what are all the different things you can do? And I actually have a lot of local friends who are wedding photographers. All their events were just canceled. So they're now scrambling to figure out, well, how can I update my lines of business? And some are now turning to, okay, I will teach the next person down the line how to be a photographer. And that's now another line that they're adding. So some of it's born out of necessity, but it's good to think about these things in good times. It's just as critical to think about them now and in more stressful times. So in regards to the different lines of business, I think what she has said applies to many different industries, many different businesses um, and business owners. And talking about limiting beliefs, I think that's something we've seen underscored by so many guests that have been on the show. They didn't believe that they could uh, start their business. They didn't believe that they could ask for that raise or that promotion or that remote work opportunity. They didn't believe that they could be debt free because th they were conditioned. They saw their parents always in debt. They felt that they would always be in debt. So whether it's, you know, these financial, these, you know, non, non-creative <laughs> elements or whether it's starting your own business, I think it's just writing down those beliefs and then saying them out loud and realizing like, well, that's silly. Um, and that's one thing that I've taken to and, I, you know, even after I wrote my own books and I publish them and I'm helping people, I still have limiting beliefs. You know, they don't go away. There's just new ones that come up that I have to constantly challenge. And obviously finding a great mentor, I say, um, digital mentor, Joanna, um, cause I only met her, uh, during the interview once, um, you know, that helps me to continually challenge these other limiting beliefs I have of, well, what could be my top line limit of what income I can make with my books? What are the things I can do? Like I even said with switching over to nonfiction. Um, and I think those are the limiting beliefs that, you know, it doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your experience level. They always come up and it's just finding new ways to challenge them, uh, to continually overcome them. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, this is such an, you mentioned your friends that are photographers that are suddenly finding kind of the work drying up at the moment. And there's a lot of small business owners and entrepreneurs and side hustlers that, had freelance work or other gigs that are kind of drying up at the moment. There's other people that haven't even started, you know, are still in their nine to five and, and that work is drying up or they're getting less hours or et cetera. And my thought is on this is 
if you have a lot of time and not a lot of work coming in at the moment, but you've taken care of the basics, you understand you have an emergency fund in place, you have some margin in your life, like you're doing what you can to make sure you can provide for yourself and your family and you still find yourself with extra time and energy, what an opportunity to start focusing on your talent stack for to build the skills that will be in demand when this pops back. And maybe actually you get some insight and to what will be in demand and what won't be in demand. And you can start preparing yourself for that inevitable shift in the winds. Um, I can tell you right now, when it comes to like freelance work, like podcast editing is a skill. It's one that can be learned. Our good friend, Steve Stewart, who edits this podcast, he is in very, very high demand right now and has as much work as he can handle. This is a skill that can be learned without a college degree, right? Video editing. I don't know. Pick pick any number of skill. It does, I, I just picked these two digital because it happens to be the space that we are in. But anything that you want to learn can be learned if you can dedicate some time and energy to learning it. What an opportunity to build out your talent stack. Brad, this is something that we've talked about many times, but now maybe someone has time to actually follow through on something that they have desired to do for a long time. Yeah, yeah, this is that is a silver lining, right? Like you have the time. You cannot make that excuse anymore. And I think I think you can look both in terms of concrete and specific skills like you're talking about and also maybe more just general skills for life. And it, it's funny that uh, you actually had no idea that I was doing this, but I've been I've been uh, keeping a, a little text document actually of like if I were to create, or not me, but if I could get the worldwide expert on certain topics to do like a one hour presentation, like what would be the skills that I think would be necessary to succeed at life? And, you know, I'm kind of, uh, this is very much a work in progress. And I swear, Jonathan, we did not talk about this beforehand, but, uh, you know, I'm thinking even just things like probabilistic thinking, I've talked about Annie Duke and like thinking in terms of, of, uh, thinking in bets and probability, cognitive biases, positive psychology, even just a background in investing or taxation, like a one hour. How many people know anything about tax? N nobody, right? Like how much better off would you be if you had an hour of that? Are you designing meditation? your own degree? I am designing my own degree. <laughs> and I have to say, I it, it's pretty cool, right? Like, you know, even down to like building businesses and real estate, how to maximize sleep and you know, habits like, you know, atomic habits and like make time with John Zeratsky. And I actually kind of, if you would, uh, indulge me here for a minute, I got this inspiration from a guy named Naval Ravikant, who is, uh, I guess, a early stage investor in, uh, in Silicon Valley. Anybody who's familiar with the Tim Ferriss podcast would have, would have heard this, but, uh, I'm going to read this. And, and I think this is just kind of like a way to think about life. And he said, yeah, if I'm running a grade school curriculum for children, I would probably optimize happiness, nutrition, diet, exercise. How do you build good habits? How do you break bad habits? How do you have good relationships? How do you find your spouse? Meditation. How do you build basic skills, not memorize lots of facts? What kinds of books should you read? Older ones, not newer ones, ones that work. Have them work on something charitable related or take them to the third world and show them suffering true suffering so they can get some context. I'd probably teach them public speaking, business writing, basic persuasion, maybe a little bit of programming on top of the reading, writing, and arithmetic. I'd probably eliminate chunks of geography, history, and honestly, even second or third languages. I thought that like that, just hearing him talk for 30 seconds like that changed my entire thinking on education. And like, like we said, I've been, I've been brainstorming this for probably the last couple of weeks now of just like, what would I de devise to succeed at life? Cause that's how I think about like my job as a parent is, and I would actually throw board games in there because I think the strategy that you learn from board games and like the decision-making and having to relate with different people and their strategies, like, I think that is a massive one. So like, I feel what like there's a choose if I masterclass in the future here. Is that, I is that think coming? There is. I, I think that was actually... <laughs> That was actually how I was brainstorming this, Jonathan. I didn't tell you about it until uh, we literally have record now. So, uh, yeah. But I mean, right? Isn't that isn't that an interesting way? And like, why can't you learn about these things? You have the time. You're not going anywhere. You know, at some point, 
I've, I think I'm going to have a real opportunity to have a hand in kind of molding my son's education in a very like active sense. And I would hope, because I agree with everything you just said. I mean, if you could kind of stack, here's the skills that you need to succeed at life, the actual execution of those, how you get these, there's a lot of leniency in how it would be executed on. But like, if you had these skills, you're going to crush this game that we call life. And getting the opportunity to think through what that would look like now gives you a lot of freedom in saying, forget that in a degree, I'm not, I'm not trashing a degree. This, this is not in any way putting degrees. So, but I'm saying set the actual degree to the side. If an individual, a young man or woman has these skills locked down as they become an adult responsible for their own life, they will thrive. It's a mathematical certainty. That's the, if you have that mentality, it gives you a lot of freedom saying, well, how do I, you know, I have this end result in, in, in mind, how they get there gives you a lot of flexibility with how you build that. Uh, and you have a lot of time to think through it. And, I, and I'm sure, Brad, you know, your timeline's a little bit more compressed, but at the same point, uh, what, how, what is this looking like as you start to take this model and say, Molly, Anna, I think it'd be important that you have these concepts locked down. How does that manifest in your own personal reality? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you're right. It is a little compressed as compared to, to your kids, obviously, though my kids are not old by any means. They are eight and 11. So, you know, I am uh, in some way running out of time. I have seven here, years but... to pontificate. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. That's all I got. But no, I mean, I, I do think about this, right? Like I try to not be the overbearing dad. Like I, I, I never want to be that person. Cause I feel like, you know, that, that kind of perspective gets tuned out. Um, I try to phrase everything in terms of like, you know, here's a strategy. Like if, if my kids would describe me as like my lessons as one thing, it would be strategies. So it's like me talking both about, you know, things that I do well and things that I don't do well. So it's not like, oh, here's this, you know, omniscient dad who knows everything. Like that's not how, how I roll at all. I just try to teach them lessons. And like I said, even like board games, like I think, I think board games are one of the best ways to succeed at life because they teach you just skills. I think another thing actually, uh, I think I mentioned to you, but I, I, uh, didn't give you all the info beforehand that I sat down with my girls yesterday with the book, the simple startup. So we had Rob feeling on the podcast. What was it? Probably a month ago at this point. Um, and you know, in all fairness, at that time, I said how beautiful this book was. I had flipped through it and, and it was remarkable. But yesterday I sat down with my kids for the very first time. So it's a beginner's guide to starting a business. And I mean, this is the most honest and sincere review I could ever give. Like this thing was life changing for my kids. Like they lit up it was almost so akin a, a couple of years ago, Jonathan, on the podcast, I talked about when I sat down and explained compound interest to my daughter, Anna, and it was just like that light bulb moment. Well, both kids had that, but honestly, Molly, my eight-year-old had it even more yesterday with, with this simple startup book. She, it was one of these moments where <laughs> I described, and this is obviously a bit of hyperbole and a, a bit of uh, parental exaggeration, but honestly, not all that much. I said, this is what I wrote to Rob yesterday. I said, so I just had one of the best hours of my life. Maybe my eight year old Molly without m- much hyperbole is like an eight year old version of Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and Gary Vaynerchuk rolled together. <laughs> no hyperbole <laughs> there at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. So Laura, and I said, Laura was listening from the other room and called me into the kitchen. And she's like, do you believe what you're hearing from Molly? Like, do you even believe that this is coming out of this little eight-year-old pipsqueak? Like Molly is very deceptive. She has this like adorable little voice. And like, maybe you don't take her as, as seriously, like intellectually, even though you, like, we know she's extraordinarily smart, but man, she just, Jonathan, she was sketching out apropos of nothing. She'd never, we'd never explained anything. She was sketching out how she'd want her business website to look with different levels of courses. She's literally sketching it out as if she was a web designer of beginner courses, intermediate, advanced. She was talking about networking by creating relationships so that future businesses she had, she'd have a built-in network of people. I kid you not. It was unbelievable. She was talking about, well, I don't want to I'm taking notes things. right now, Brad. I'm taking notes. Right? You, you seriously should. I don't want to sell things that I only make $1 or $2 of profit on because then I have to get all these customers. Like, I need to sell something that I make a lot of money from 
so that I don't need quite as many because it's hard to get customers. She's telling me, she's like, but then she was talking about like, could I have people work for me? And then it's not just limited by my time. And she actually said she had the insight to say, I would always care more about selling than they would since it's my business. So probably each hour I could sell more, but even if I could make money by paying, you know, if I could make more money by paying them that hour, you know, then, or then I would earn more per hour than I would pay them. If I had thousands of people working for me, it's, it would still be better. I want to raise my hand, raise my hand. (laughs) You're so excited. I love it. Uh, Dude, I'm so excited. What you have just done is you have turned the simple startup and entrepreneurship into a board game, or rather you've pivoted from board games, which look like Ticket to Ride, et cetera, into entrepreneurship, this amazing puzzle. Like imagine we can have the innocence and creativity of a kid. Like ideas are coming so fast. You can't even slow them down. The whole entire world is open up to you and you're throwing them at the board and your parent is interested, is interested in all of your ideas. This is incredible. I mean, what an opportunity for, for us, for ourselves. So like, let's, let's parse this out. Let's have two separate conversations. Give yourself permission to have unbridled creativity and optimism and nothing is off limits. This isn't your only business. This is your first of many, right? We're going to keep throwing ideas at the board until something sticks and we love it for all the right reasons. We're going to explore it the same way we would think about a board game. There is no losing in You don't lose. There's no losing here. This is an opportunity to flex our creative muscles in a risk-free environment because we're not going into debt to start these ideas. Molly isn't going into debt to create this. She's flexing her creativity. And as a result, at some point, she will have a business and it's fun. There's no downside. In the meantime, let's say that, let's say that like she's not ready to execute on the business she can start building the skills necessary to make the business possible. Those skills have value in and of themselves, right? Like she she just sketched out a website. That's a skill. Now she would need to create it. I bet her dad could give her a little bit of help on resources that would be useful in creating her very first website. That's what I was thinking. Like if you can just have an, like if you can have a talent stack of skills that that you know are valuable and then start adding on to that, the mentality, the game theory, all those extra things that allow you to take it to the next level, like you've really put together a portfolio, which is going to guarantee your success. I'm incredibly inspired by your daughter. I'm sure our audience is as well, but you can, you can replicate this experience. Take the time, the bandwidth that's been freed up if it's there and let's start applying it to ourselves, working on our inner game. And let's start providing that opportunity to our kids. You shouldn't be 30 years old before you're given permission to have your first creative idea. Let's encourage that and foster that conversation now, repeatedly. This is risk-free for them. Of course, we should be having these conversations. And Brad, it sounds like you're saying the simple startup for you guys was the catalyst for that. Yeah. Yeah. That is the first of many conversations. It was funny because uh, we did that at about two o'clock yesterday afternoon. And as the kids were going to bed, they were both sitting in Anna's room, each of them with their, their copy of the book. And of course, poor old dad was exhausted. I have, uh, I actually went to sleep at like nine 20 last night and I was the one who left the simple startup party. But, uh, Molly of course brought it down with her first thing in the morning. So, uh, yeah, as soon as, honestly, as soon as we're done recording here, we're going to go, uh, do the next round of, uh, chapter two, I think it is. So yeah, this is, uh, it's really has been a game changer for us. And like we talked about, it's about just being curious. It's about building skills. Like all those things that I, that I read off, you know, that Naval Ravikant was talking about the things that I had brainstormed, like find something that interests you in there and just, just learn something new. We have time now, which is pretty awesome. And obviously I would be remiss if I didn't mention, uh, you can get this book. The probably the easiest way aside from going to the simple startup.com is just to go to the homepage of choose And at the very top, there is an our book section and you can find, uh, this book and our book, choose your blueprint to financial independence. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tomorrow. We are going to be talking about the stimulus package that was released this past week, giving you our perspective on it. So make sure you stay tuned to that. Then Friday, we have Dominic Cortuccio coming in. He's been on the show twice. We're bringing him back and to talk about inner game. Let's focus on controlling what we can control. I'm excited to share these episodes with you. So stay tuned as we continue to go down the road less traveled.